thank you all for joining us today for our presentation of The New American Farmer by Dr. Laura Ann Minkoff Thurn. My name is Kristen Reynolds and I am a lecturer in the Food Studies and Environmental Studies programs at the New School in New York City. And I'm currently coordinating special programs and events in food studies. So I wanted to start by thanking those who have helped to put this event together. Uh, first of all, Dr. B. Banu, who is the chair of the Food Studies program, and has been very supportive of this from the beginning, which started last spring when we wanted to have an in-person talk, uh, which was all scheduled and set to go, and then we had to cancel due to COVID precautions. Um, and so thanks to Dr. Banu for being supportive of us having now this online forum, which I think will be um, just as interesting and engaging. Uh, thanks to, to Yusra Bitar, who is the Food Studies Program Assistant and has been indispensable in putting the uh, event together both now and in the spring and communicating with all of you as uh, attendees. Uh, Mike Harrington is the Assistant Director of the Tishman Environment and Design Center and is also very helpful in putting this together. Um, and thanks also to Shaked Landur, who is the Program Manager of the Environmental Studies Program. All three of these programs, Food Studies, Environmental Studies, and the Tishman Environment and Design Center are the co-sponsors of today's event. Uh, and I wanted to just give a special shout out to students in my food and environment course who are here and ready. I know they're gonna have some questions for Dr. McLaughlin um, when we get to that se section of our event. Uh, so I thought I'd say just a few words about the Food Studies program here uh, at the New School. I know that many of you are joining from outside of New York. Uh, the Food Studies program has BA and BS options for undergraduates who can, make, who can specialize or concentrate in three areas, culture, media, and communication, health and environment, or policy and politics. Some of those classes are also available to the public through what's called the Open Campus Program at the New School. And we have a number of events throughout the year, such as this one, Much, most of them, if not all of them are online at this point, um, that are co-hosted, some of them by additional units and programs at the New School, like today's talk. Um, so if you're interested in seeing more about future events, you can go to events.newschool.edu. And finally, for more information about the Food Studies Program, you can send an email to our email account, which is foodstudies at newschool.edu. And I think that you start is going to put that in the chat for everybody to see. Uh, so the only other slide I have is some housekeeping. Um, as you have been informed already, this event is being recorded. We're asking that people please use the chat window for your questions and answers. And you start and I will be collecting those and asking some of them in the question and answer period after Dr. Minkoff Zurin's talk. Um, around 5 p.m. Eastern time is when we'll do the Q&A. Uh, and we ask you to, of course, take, uh, please leave your mics off so that we can have full attention and, and sound coming from our speaker. Uh, and so I'm going to stop sharing these slides and ask her to pull, Laura Ann, to pull up hers while I tell you a little bit about her work and her scholarship. Uh, so Dr. Uh, Laura Ann minkoff Byrne is Associate Professor and Director of Graduate Studies in Food Studies at Syracuse University, where she's also affiliated faculty in the Departments of Geography and Women and Gender Studies and the Learner School of Public Health Promotion, all at Syracuse University. Her research and teaching broadly explore the interactions between food and racial justice, labor, labor movements, and transnational environmental and agricultural policy. This focus builds upon her extensive experience with agricultural biodiversity projects abroad, combined with work on immigrant health issues domestically in the United States. And so in addition to her book about which we are about to hear much more, she's also published in many journals, including GeoForum, the Journal of Peasant Studies, Food Culture and Society, Agriculture and Human Values, Antipode, and more. She earned her PhD in geography from the University of California, Berkeley. And as we were discussing just before we started today, um, lives in Syracuse with her husband and two daughters. I know they're spending a lot of time in close quarters together, as many of us are with our families. Um, I, on a personal note, I've known Dr. Minkoff Zorn for a number of years through the American Association of Geographers Food and Agriculture Specialty Group. And she's really one of the scholars whose work I turn to when I want to understand the historical and contemporary context of, of farm labor, um, immigration policy as it relates to agriculture. Uh, in the United States and transnationally. And so without further ado, it is my pleasure to pass the virtual mic to her and to hear more about her book. 
Thank you so much for that uh, introduction. Um, can everyone hear me okay? Great. Um, and thank you so much to everyone um, at the new school that's been so accommodating in moving this talk um, and making it happen still. Um, as I've um, told Kristen, uh, the, this talk is kind of part of my COVID story because the last thing, this was kind of the reality of COVID really hit the week that I was supposed to come and do this talk in person in New York. And this was kind of like my realization that this was going to be a big deal when I had to cancel the trip. So I was supposed to be in New York the week that everything is shut down specifically. Um, so it's really nice to come kind of full circle and still be able to give this talk. And with the added benefit of having people um, able to come all over the country. Um, and so, you know, having it as a, as a truly public talk is one of the, the odd you know, silver linings, I think, of the pandemic with scholarship and people being able to join in from, from all over for all types of um, talks and sessions and ways to educate ourselves right now. Um, so that said, I know everyone has a lot of options for things to go to, and I really appreciate people coming to hear about the book today. Um, welcome to my attic, <laughs> where I am in Syracuse, New York. Um, so today I'll be speaking about my new book, The New American Farmer, which came out last year with MIT Press. Um, so uh, people that haven't had a chance to look at it, I always like to kind of remind myself and others, um, it's available from MIT Press. It's also available on their website as a free PDF. It's open access. Um, so if people want to read more and haven't had a chance, it's there for anyone to read, which I'm also really happy about. Um, go ahead and go a bit into the content of the book. So um, in the talk today and in the, the larger narrative of the book, um, I've been doing research with um, Latino, Latina immigrant farmers in the United States um, for the past uh, eight or nine years. Um, and while my book is a qualitative study, um, I did work across five different states over a hundred different interviews um, over several chunks of time. I like to start with looking actually at the quantitative data um, that supports what I'm about to talk about. So while you could kind of trust me and all the interviews I did and my analysis, um, there's also USDA agricultural census data that talks about um, this phenomenon of people that identify as Latino, Latina, Hispanic, Latinx, um, you know, going into farming at increasing rates, especially as compared to other um, farmers in the United States today. So the USDA defines um, traditional farmers as US born white farmers, um, but they do um, do a census every four years where they ask farmers about their personal um, ethnic and racial identity. Um, so while the ways that I categorize farmers are a bit different, I'm in, in what I'm gonna talk about today, I'm looking specifically at people that are first generation immigrants um, that have come through the ranks of farm work. So that come to the US as farm laborers and then start their own farms. So the um, USDA census is, is broader um, anyone that identifies as Hispanic um, or Latino, according to their, their data, um, what we see is there's a 21% increase over five years, and that's much greater than any other group of farmers in the United States today. Um, what we know is that farmers overall, um, aren't the numbers are actually going down, and so there's a real need to look at who's farming the U.S. today, what kind of knowledge do they have, and what types of gaps are they filling? So we know that um, Latino, Latina um, farmers are the fastest group of farmers in the US today. Um, and while in many ways, I'll talk about why that's really surprising, in a lot of ways, it's really not surprising as well. So as I was saying, um, immigrant farmers in the United States today are filling a gap. Um, half of farm operators in the U.S. are actually reaching retirement age, so it's 65 and older, and most of their kids don't really want to go into farming for really clear reasons. Farming is becoming more economically challenging um, as farmers are dealing with things like climate change, trade wars, um, and just really grueling jobs that they have the option to not do. Um, farmers' kids are um, going into really any other type of, of option than taking over the family farm. Um, and so what we're seeing is the number of farmers going down. 
Um, while there's more and more of a demand, as most people in food studies will know, or at least um, this is partially why we're all interested, there's more a demand of a demand for regional, local food, and specifically for organic food. Um, while we aren't currently able to meet that demand um, within the U.S., and so what I'm pointing to here is that we have a, you know, a growing gap in terms of who is going to farmers and but into farming, but also specifically the types of um, food and types of farming that there's more and more demand for. And I'll talk about um, later in my talk about why what I found is that immigrant farmers are specifically filling this gap and desire for um, smaller scale regional as well as organic or what we may call alternative food, um, much more so than other farmers due to their agrarian histories and backgrounds and the type of knowledge base that they come to the US with. So this is a quote that um, I found to be, this is one of the interviews I found to be one of the most inspiring. This is a farmer in Washington state um, who, when she was describing her farm, Mariposa Farm, which means um, butterfly in Spanish, she said, we wanted to name it Mariposa because do you know the story of the monarchs, the monarch butterflies? They need to fly from Mexico to Canada. Some of them die crossing the border to reach Canada. Some of the parents die during the trip, but the children know how to come back. I think that we as Latinos have a lot in common with butterflies because in order to be here, we have to cross the borders. And sadly, a lot of times families lose their loved ones, but their children here and the children who are born here always have the need of knowing their parents' roots and always go looking for it. Um, and this quote really encompasses a lot of what I'm gonna talk about today in terms of the reasons that people um, are, are still farming despite all the challenges, the ways that they're connecting to the land, the ways that, um, that farming and agrarian livelihoods are really a part of their culture and a part of passing on their culture to their children and teaching them about their food ways and their roots in agriculture. So here's a list of a lot of questions I looked at over the course of all of this research and ones that I pursue in the book in different ways. It's a lot to talk about today, so I won't be able to go into all of this. I'm gonna narrow it down to just three questions. Um, so why are, immigrant farters, why are immigrant farm workers starting their own farms despite enormous challenges? So why is it that people go from working and laboring on other people's farms to starting their own farms, even when we know that it's incredibly difficult? And I'll talk about what those challenges look like. How does their race, ethnicity, and citizenship status affect their agricultural practices and agrarian identity. So what is it in particular about immigrant farmers, and in this case, immigrant farmers primarily from rural parts of Mexico, um, how does that translate to the types of farming that they're doing in the US today? Um, what does that look like? And then the kind of question I end with is, what is their role in today's growing alternative agri-food movements? Um, and, and arguing that it, it should be um, even greater, that there's, they have a lot to contribute to um, agri-food movements and, and the types of ways we wanna see agriculture change um, today. So of course, I'm not the first person to look at some of these types of questions. Um, so I draw a lot on work in um, kind of food ways and um, critical race theory. Um, and I, I combine some of the work on political economy of food and land with work on agrarian um, culture and racial identity. Um, some of this work um, has been done in food studies and humanities and geography and sociology, but really understanding the importance of food and agrarian livelihoods to maintaining um, people's culture and their identity, right? What is food beyond just something that we eat? What is a farm beyond just a business. Um, and I look a lot at that of why the farm is a and, and a land-based livelihood is more is different than just any other type of business, right? So the types of agrarian questions that we see in the field of political economy, the questions of um, you know, how is it that farming and small-scale farming um, and kind of non-industrial farming is still surviving today and why? Um, and I'm not going to focus so much on those types of theoretical questions today. Um, I've written some other articles that I'm happy to talk about in terms of agrarian questions of land and labor. Um, but what I really try and contribute is that we have to look and take seriously race, ethnicity, and immigration in these questions of um, 
of agricultural change. So this study, as I was saying, um, is based on about, well, it, it kind of, it, it's based on about eight years of work, but really closer to 10 since it came out of a lot of my dissertation research. Um, it scanned, uh, spanned across five different states. So I started my work as a graduate student at Berkeley um, in the central coast of California. And when I was there, I was looking at farm worker food insecurity and ways that farm workers were quite ironically coping with their own food insecurity, right? The people working in the fields that couldn't feed themselves using their agricultural knowledge. And I started this research um, because I was really interested in the ways that farm workers contributed to agriculture, not just through laboring, not just as workers, but because they have so much knowledge and history um, in their own history in agriculture. And I learned this um, working on farms in California myself, where I found that while um, farming was not my own calling, in fact, I just gained so much respect for how difficult it was, I was really interested in talking to the farm workers. And, and what I really learned is they had every much more of a right to be farming that I did without an agricultural background. They had so much more knowledge. And yet oftentimes in agriculture, immigrant workers are just thought of as laborers. Um, so in my study of farm worker food insecurity, I wanted to highlight that. Um, so I started looking at farm worker gardens, and then I started seeing that a lot of farm workers in California were actually starting their own farm businesses. And this is something people in agriculture, particularly in California, where um, access to land and resources is really high, people told me there's no way that that's really happening. So I started to find that during my dissertation and then wanted to follow these questions around immigrant farmers and farm workers turned farmers through my postdoctoral work and then my work here at Syracuse. So the research in a lot of ways um, is reflective of different places I was at across the country. So the, I also did work um, in the Hudson Valley of New York in um, uh, in uh, Washington State, as well as in um, Minnesota and uh, the northern neck of uh, Virginia. And so certainly immigrant farmers are not limited to these regions or states. These are the places that I kind of followed the research, um, either learning about a farm incubator training center or hearing from someone at a conference that there was a whole community of immigrant farmers where they were and I should come there and talk to people. Um, so across this time, um, I interviewed about 70 different immigrant farmers. As I said, they were all farm workers, almost all from Mexico, although some from Central America, all that had started their own farm business, either renting or owning land in one of these areas. Um, I also interviewed about 30 people that work with um, immigrant farmers, so either people from Cooperative Extension, USDA offices, farmers market managers, nonprofit organizers, but that had a real connection with immigrant farmers. So as I was speaking about, I'm looking really at this transition, which in um, agrarian studies we call partially the agrarian question, right, is how are people still persisting in agriculture today, small scale farmers, alternative farmers, um, you know, what does that look like? Why aren't they all just going industrial? So what we're seeing is farmers and, and everyone that I interviewed always identified as a farmer, as, as a campesino, right? As, as someone that um, was not just a worker. So even when they worked on industrial farms, say in California or Washington state, they always identified as a farmer. And so it was just a matter of getting back the resources and access um, to land to start their own farm again. Yet, as I was speaking about, the limitations or the challenges to starting one's own farm um, are huge when you're an immigrant. Um, many of the people I talked to were undocumented. Um, you know, all of the, uh, some of them, um, you know, Spanish wouldn't even be their first language. Many of them were indigenous from uh, Southern Mexico, speaking Triqui or Mixteco. Um, so while there are challenges to any young and beginning farmers um, in the United States today, huge structural um, challenges. The challenges are not much greater um, when you're an immigrant, when you don't look like other farmers in your area, um, when you don't have a paperwork trail. Um, and so I asked them a lot about these challenges. Um, what I found was navigating bureaucracy was a huge barrier. Many of them, while they have extensive agricultural knowledge um, and experience, many of them didn't have beyond an elementary school or middle school education in Mexico. Many of them were not fully literate. 
Um, and so when you think about the difference between farming in Mexico and starting a farm business in the United States, that's enormous, filling out the forms. People don't realize how bureaucratic farming is in the US. So just to sell at a farmer's market, there's tons of forms you may need to, to fill out. You may need to have um, um, proof of your land ownership or rental. Um, you have different forms of ID you need to show. If you wanna get any type of loan from say an official institution like the USDA or apply for organic certification, again, tons of paperwork. And in doing this work, a lot of people said, well, farmers hate paperwork. Farmers are just notorious for hating paperwork, right? That's not why anyone gets into farming, which of course is true. But then imagine if you had to do that and you didn't speak English and you hadn't been through high school, um, but you were still really committed to this, this dream of having your own farm and, and really not having to work for someone else on their own farm anymore, but getting to envision what a farm looks like for yourself and your family. Um, so these barriers were enormous yet, people were still doing it. Um, and so of course, the type of barriers that they were um, facing was not just bureaucratic. Of course, there's also the day-to-day -day discrimination. Many of them talked about discrimination from other farmers. Imagine um, that traditional farmers in the US, when they see people that, that they're used to having work for them, their workers all of a sudden are starting their own businesses. A lot of farmers did not like that, right? There was, a, in many regions of the US, there's a good old boys type of network. Um, that guard things from access to the farmer's market um, to, you know, relationships in the local USDA office. Um, rarely did they say they found there was discrimination from customers, much more so from other farmers. Um, and then, of course, there's the challenge of going into a, a government office and asking for a loan. And I think when people um, hear about the USDA, oftentimes we think the USDA, the United States Department of Agriculture, is just um, kind of for the big commodity crop farmers, right? For wheat or soy. Um, but actually small scale farmers and diversified farmers also get a lot of resources, whether it's a loan, um, help with a project like a hoop house that might help you get through the year. A lot of different types of farmers access um, government resources, um, a grant to do a value added project. Um, so these are really important for small scale farmers too, albeit not at the scale of the, the industrial farmers, um, but when they're small scale farmers and then they can't even access the same types of startup opportunities as other farmers, it's really, really difficult. So this is um, one farmer in California it was actually a pretty established farmer. She had had um, her own you know, rented land for about 20 years. Um, and she had gone through one of the first training programs in California that was geared towards immigrant farmers. And she said to me, when you go to an agency and you're a Latino person and you're a woman and you don't speak the language and you don't have money and you're going to the agency of a federal government and you wanna find someone to speak your language, how do you say this? The government doesn't wanna help you. They don't want to have a person that speaks your language. Um, and so of course, in, in more conversation with her, she means this literally when she went in, no one spoke Spanish, which is amazing in certain parts of California um, where the majority of people involved in agriculture only speak Spanish, right? Um, but also that she felt unwelcome. She felt like she went in, people saw her as a worker, they didn't see her as someone that could have their own farm, not the type of person they were used to working with. And this was also evidence when I would call regional offices, whether it was Cooperative Extension or USDA, and oftentimes they'd say, you know, I'm doing a research project with immigrant farmers there, I've met many of them in your region, do you have anyone there that works with immigrant farmers? Um, or could speak to me about it, and the office would just say, well, we don't, we don't work with farm workers. You should call the Department of Labor. They'd say, well, no, I mean farmers. And they couldn't even kind of, at first at least, understand who I was talking about. And this is sometimes in regions um, where within one county you'd have 30 farmers from Oaxaca, right, that I had already interviewed. Um, and yet they were really under the radar of these agencies that are meant to assist farmers and to assist all farmers. So this is a huge barrier that they were up against, both structurally and kind of individually. Um, of course, then if this has also been recorded or, or um, you know, we see this institutionally and historically. So many people have heard of the Pigford case um, of African, African American farmers that have been discriminated against by the USDA, but there was also a less known Hispanic farmers and Hispanic far and women farmers were put into the same class action suit. 
Um, there was also one for Native American farmers. And this is a very specific time period while farmers were applying for USDA loans and essentially the USDA admitted the discrimination. And during my research, it was being settled by a claims process. Um, and what they started to find was, I believe over 90% of the claims were rejected because people filled out the forms wrong, right? These are people that went through the hoops of identifying they had been discriminated against 20 years later are trying to fill out forms. And again, still don't, they don't have the assistance or ability to, um, to be um, reimbursed for the ways that they were discriminated against. So this is really deep seated um, types of discrimination and institutional barriers. So why would people still be farming, right? I mean, this is incredibly challenging. Not only are you being discriminated against in multiple forms, you have kind of institutional barriers. You're as a as a farm worker and an immigrant, you're much less likely to have the type of family money or capital to help you rent or start a farm or buy a tractor. Um, but yet there was still this huge desire among immigrant farm workers to start their own farm business. And so I really wanted to understand why that was, what was still driving people. Um, and what I heard time and time again was that this was really important as immigrants, as people raising children in the United States, um, to recreate a sense of home, of to use their agricultural knowledge and practices um, you know, to create something familiar that felt good to them. Um, and that really then was um, reflected in the type of farming that they were doing, which was not industrial size, right? They or scale or style. They weren't trying to recreate the kind of farms they were working on. They wanted to create the kind of farms that they had had in Mexico that felt like home. So the desire to stay small, um, anywhere from four to 60 acres, the average was about 15. Um, low um, non-organic input. So not all of them were certified organic because as I was saying, there's a whole set of hoops and barriers to even be certified. Um, which I'm proud to say the book has helped point some of that out, at least the Northeast Organic um, Farming Association is starting to address some of those barriers as I've been in touch with them about it. Um, but um, so things like just language, right? And how do you make sure all your forms are in Spanish? Um, but so if they weren't certified or organic, because so many of them had experience in the fields, had experience getting sick from um, you know, flyover um, pesticides being applied to the fertilizers in the fields. And because family was such an essential part of the farm, so whether it was, you know, their teenage kids helping them on the weekends or a toddler napping beside the farm in the afternoon or their parents, you know, helping them pack boxes, um, they wanted their family on the farm and they wanted it to be safe and to feel healthy. Um, and so not only was their family eating from the farm, but they were taking part in farming with them. And that really changed the type of farm that they wanted to have. They wanted to be a place for their family to recreate and take part in this livelihood. Um, and not to say that everyone wanted their kids to grow up and become farmers, but they wanted to teach them about it and offer that to them. Um, and of course, having a much more diverse farm is more representative of how they feed their families. And that was always first, came first, feeding your family, and then how do you grow to a, to a, a profitable business? Um, and of course, preserving different kinds of food ways, varieties, um, you know, herbs that they couldn't find in the market that they could share with their community was always a big part of how they did it. And even if they ended up, say, selling fewer crops on the market, they always were still growing beside it a more diverse set of crops for their family. So the farm inherently, right, takes on the form of what we might think of as an alternative farm. Um, by nature of the ways that they already know how to farm. And so I'll get to the, the argument towards the end, but kind of the spoiler is we should be looking at these kinds of farmers um, and immigrant farmers that are really under the radar when we're thinking about how to create alternative food systems, right? So many people um, are interested in, in creating alternative food systems that are better ecologically, that have um, more of a social justice framework, and, on, and oftentimes we're looking at white farmers that don't have an agricultural background, that are struggling to learn these things and not looking to the farm workers that are all over the United States that already have this knowledge. So this is a farmer in New York um, that's really struggled to, to keep his farm open actually. Since I first interviewed him, the farm kind of closed and they couldn't make it. And then they just reopened their farm again, which is wonderful to see. 
Um, and Carlos said, it's part of our heritage. We want to be able to not have to get up at a certain time, jump in a car, leave your house. It's more a way of a, of a way of life to be able to raise your kids at home because everyone where we're from has their own farm. Every single person in town had their own farm, right? And what he's pointing to is this isn't just a business for him. This is a livelihood. This is a place for his family. Um, it's, a, it's a different way of life than working for someone else. It's a different way of life than owning a different kind of business. Um, this is another farmer um, in Virginia and she, she actually had a beautiful combination of vegetables and flowers that she sold at the market. She said, life in the United States is very, very ugly. Each person stays in their own house. There's no time. People live by their watch and there's a lot of stress. In contrast, on her farm, it's a little bit like Mexico. It makes me feel the same. It's not the same exactly, but more free. In the city, there's more pressure. Um, you know, so to be able to stay in a rural area, um, not have to move into the city, but also not have to stay as a farm worker, which is incredibly um, difficult and exploitative. So a lot of people would ask me, well, why would you go to work on a farm all day and then leave and farm at night? And in the the truth is it's just incredibly different to have their own farm. They might be on a farm, say in California, just planting garlic all day, sitting on the back of a tractor, doing the same thing all day long, right? Or picking lettuce. They have no control over what their day-to-day -day tasks are, what's being planted, what kind of you know um, chemicals they're being exposed to. Um, but on their own farm, it was incredibly different. They choose what to plant. They do things the way that they know how to do things. They bring their family there. Um, so it's, it's a really different experience. So another, you know, beyond the question of um, why do you do this? It's so hard. What I always talk to farmers a lot about was, well, why do you do it differently than the farms around you? So particularly in California, I talked to a lot of farmers and visited a lot of very small, almost micro farms that were very diverse. Um, and they were in the midst of, especially in Santa Cruz County, strawberries, right? Just strawberries everywhere. And then I would follow a farmer off on a side road, up a little hill to some very kind of, um, you know, not flat ground, very difficult to farm on. Um, and I'd say, well, why are you doing this here? This is, this is strawberry country. It seems like this is, you know, very different than everyone around you. It's different than what you were working in. And so they, I, when comparing themselves to industrial farmers, again, kind of for those of you um, in agrarian studies, the agrarian question, right? Why a small farm? Why does it look different than the other farms? Um, this, this is kind of the answers that came from that. So one farmer, Mateo, said, well, I like the life of a farmer. I don't necessarily recommend it. You have to love agriculture. You need to love farming more than you love money. One of the first things is you have to love this. You don't do it for the money that's part of farming, right? I mean, so they're accepting that this is not a smart business venture, right? If they wanted to start a business with what savings they have, they would do something else. They're doing it for a different reason. And I think that that's really significant when we're trying to understand agrarian transitions and how to create a more sustainable food system um, is that there's something about this that can't be explained through um, strict political economy or strict understandings of class and economics that we have to also understand culture um, and, and why people wanna farm rather than do something else. And of course, that's not to say this isn't still a business. It absolutely is. They're not subsistence farmers. They're not just doing it for fun. They need to support their families, which I'll get into how that creates um, barriers to kind of social change, of course. Um, but, it, but it is still something different than just a business. And one farmer said to me just really bluntly, well, they do it for the money, I do it for the freedom. And I think that's really significant coming from someone that's um, come across a border, worked for other people, been in industrial farming for many years, and then has the freedom to do this themselves, right? And of course, they're still beholden to the market, to land prices, to um, water shortages, but, it's, but at its heart, it feels more free. So as I was saying, um, in the book, I make a case that um, immigrant farmers are already contributing to the alternative food system while they're not being um, recognized as such necessarily. We don't see um, obviously the face of farm workers. We don't oftentimes see non-white faces up on the Whole Foods placards of who's, who's providing your food. I think that's changing, of course. And even since I started working on this book, we're seeing a huge movement of farmers of color um, 
being being recognized in these in these spaces, which is wonderful. But we still have work to do. Um, so when I say alternative, as I've been talking about, I mean small scale, low input, diverse far, diverse types of um, cropping systems, not monocrops, as well as direct markets and mostly family labor. And I can speak to any one of these in more detail. People have questions. Um, but mostly they were selling at farmers markets and um, that's what they were familiar with and that's where, you know, the market for small scale really diversified farmers. It's really difficult for them to sell to the big grocery stores or chains or um, kind of middle people um, wholesalers because of the types of farming that they're doing. Um, and mostly family labor, so that's a really important point in terms of agrarian transition. Um, and one of the limitations in terms of social justice. So they're still dependent on mostly family labor, not wanting to hire outside their family. I always like to point out that doesn't mean that hiring your own family members um, is some kind of foolproof way to avoid labor exploitation. Um, family members can still be exploited. And of course, um, there are all types of gender dynamics on farms that I didn't even get into here. Um, but it's significant that they, they really want to avoid hiring other people. Um, so kind of the, the takeaways from all of this, and I'll, I'll try and wrap up soon and hopefully get to answer some questions, um, is that immigrant farmers, they show us a real opportunity um, in ways that low resource farmers and farmers of color can, are part of the alternative food system, right? The question is, how do we recognize them and support them? Um, which I, I do talk about in the book and I can talk more about, um, right? Is what types of policy changes do we need? Um, but um, I also want to point out that this example is not um, foolproof, right? We have to understand that they're under the same economic and market pressures to become more industrial as every other farmer is. So I even saw over the period of several years with certain farmers, if they couldn't get into a good, a good farmer's market, right? So in the Bay Area, it's really hard to get a spot in, say, San Francisco or Berkeley where people can pay more money for food. If you can't sell in a high end market, it's sometimes hard to sell in a market because people can't pay as much in lower income areas. And then you can't run your farm. Um, so if they have to sell, start selling to um, like a cooler or a wholesaler, they have to reduce crop diversity if they can't get in with those limited numbers of high end customers, right? So there's a problem. Um, and of course, if they scale up, if they go more the wholesale route, if they have to get bigger in order to make money, they also have to hire non-family labor, which comes back to the problem of, um, of food justice, right? Of labor justice. And the fact that they don't have any more money than the farmer down the road. In fact, they probably have less if they're immigrants um, working within this system and they don't necessarily have the ability to pay their workers any better. Um, and so I saw a lot of the same in the, the farmers that had gotten a little larger. I saw some of the same problems, some of the same conversations, you know, well, I was a farm worker. So of course I give them breaks. Of course I give them gator grade, but no, I can't pay them any more than I was paid. Um, so those are some of the structural problems um, that we still have to, to address um, in, in finding alternatives to the food system that we're currently in. Um, so I'm happy to answer, of course, any questions you know, go further in any of those, those points. Uh, I always like to end with um, this quote from a, a very um, small scale farmer in Washington state. He was farming on about half an acre and in an incubator farm project up there called Viva Farms. And he was still working during the day in his industrial farming job in berries. And so I'd say, well, why are you doing this? Um, and he said, well, if the sun comes out for everybody, why have envy? It comes out for everybody. It comes out for the blondes, the Latinos, the Japanese, for everybody. The sun does not discriminate and the rain falls for every farmer. Um, so he still felt, right, there's a chance for him. There's a reason that he's still, he's still gonna persist. Um, of course, I always wanna recognize my, my funding sources, all the students that have, that have helped me um, through, through getting through the, the book and the larger project. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and stop my screen so I can hopefully see some of you <laughs> since I was just looking at my screen the whole time, which is awkward as anyone knows that does this. Um, yeah, I, any, any questions or, or comments that people have? Although I guess, um, am I gonna moderate it or Kristen? Well, I think what we'd like to do, uh, especially because we're so numerous here, is if folks could type their question into the chat and Yusra and I are going to try to 
make sure questions get answered and asked and answered. <laughs> um, so if folks can do that, we'll do that. Um, and maybe I could start with one, uh, which is, well, well, folks gather their thoughts about their own questions, uh, which is about the agricultural practices and, and their relationship to environmental health. Um, so I, I'm just wondering if you could say a little bit more about two parts of that. Um, <clears throat> one, you've talked about um, more diverse cropping systems. And I'm wondering if, what, if you saw a pattern in terms of uh, the farmers using um, intercropping, meaning planting the you know multiple plants or crop types together in the same row versus having multiple crops on a farm and um, but in, you know not together. And then the second part of that is if you saw any differences with respect to the use of pesticides because I know that's a big issue with respect to farm workers and their exposure to pesticides. So thanks, Kristen. Um, so, so the question is, did I see intercropping and did I see a difference in pesticide use, like as compared to other farmers in the area? Yes. Yeah, so the, the question of intercropping, that was always the first thing. That was always the most noticeable thing, both kind of just driving up to the farm and when I would get a tour around the farm. Um, and so it was just very notably different, especially, you know, anywhere that I went, whatever, whether it was the Midwest or the East Coast or the West Coast, um, I'd see industrial farming around, um, you know, whether it was the, the strawberries or whatever. Um, and then I'd get to one of these farms and it was just so noticeable how diverse they were. Um, and absolutely, in fact, um, one of the slides showed from the black dirt region in Virginia um, where it was just um, so many different greens and herbs, just like everything planted so close. I oftentimes saw traditional kind of milpa, um, corn spleens and squash. Um, that wasn't usually their market garden, but that'd be like right next to whatever they were growing together. So that was the most noticeable difference between them and say their neighbors. Um, and in fact, I even heard in different regions, if I talked to, you know, kind of the um, people that work with farmers, that was actually a complaint about these farmers is that it looked messy, right? It didn't look like an organized farm. And in fact, I have an article where I looked at the ways that um, inter intercropping on their farm made it really difficult for them to track their, um, their crops um, in the ways that the USDA needs them to, to get loans and grants. If you can't say, I have this many rows of this and this many acres of this. So the USDA, um, the forms just aren't really designed for people to actually have really diverse fields that are intercropped when you can't say, I had this many acres and this many acres. So they look really different um, just to begin with. But then when we would walk around the farms, that was also the most noticeable thing is, you know, that was always the, the first thing in a farm tour is one, well, then here you see here this and here. And so there'd be like 20 different crops described to me in one row. So things that I hadn't even noticed um, as we were walking through. So absolutely diverse. Um, and then as far as pesticide use, as, as I said, not everyone was farming organically. Um, oftentimes they just, they couldn't afford the certification. Um, you know, they weren't necessarily kind of committed to that process. Um, but there was always a conversation of, yeah, well, we don't use, you know, as many chemicals or we, even if they weren't certified, um, you know, it was sometimes unclear like what they were using and what they weren't using. Um, but, you know, definitely keeping it a safe environment for their kids was a really big deal. Um, so making sure that they were just using what they saw as kind of necessary, depending on their region and, and being able to still grow produce that would sell at the market. Um, so that, that kind of answer. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Um, thank you very much. Um, so I want to ask a, another question that's been posed. So I'll just read it, <clears throat> kind of related to this, the question I ask. What types of food were planted that were used to feel freedom to have agrobiodiversity? Agro so what types of crops are planted that allow for agrobiodiversity? Um, and this person says, I think this might be hard because the agricultural fields want specific foods to come from specific regions and not all soil produces the same food, something we've been talking about in the class. Yeah, um, and there was oftentimes a big learning curve for what could be grown in the United States versus what they might be growing in Mexico. Um, but most of the time they had been, as I said, they had worked in agriculture in the U.S. before starting their own farms. So oftentimes they knew what those barriers were already. 
Um, you know, so, and, and oftentimes they would grow a mix of kind of, well, I know what people want to see at the farmer, at the farmer's market. I know that they want broccoli, but I'm also going to grow a bunch, um, of herbs that, you know, are things that my family wants to consume. Um, and then I know that, that specific customers, um, you know, will be interested like immigrants like me, or interestingly, a lot of them found that, um, Asian immigrants were sometimes interested in this the specialty crops that they were growing for their own families. Um, so there was crossover with different immigrant communities and what people wanted to see. Um, you know, then I also had the classic example of, well, we grown, we are growing certain varieties of corn that can be ground for say like totopos or different very specific dishes that they weren't able to find in the store. Um, and it depends where they were. So like Northern neck of Virginia, they're not gonna find the same types of availability in terms of, you know, like a Mexican, meal in a store as they are in, say, the central coast of California, where there's a gazillion Mexican groceries. Um, so for some of them, the desire was really to grow crops that their family could eat. Um, and for other of them, they, they didn't need to grow that as much. But there was always a blend of kind of, what does my family eat? What do I need to sell for the market? Um, you know, and, and learning about different varieties of, of things that, that would sell. Um, here's a question um, about women in agriculture. So the person asking the question says, I've been studying growing number of women in agriculture in the United States. Do you feel that there's a growing number of Latina in this branch of the system also, or do you see an even, or I take it to mean an equal number? Yeah, and so this is uh, the question of kind of gender in the study is always one that I wish I could go back and, and do more research on. And I think, you know, anyone that's done a long-term research project, you kind of find there's always like those, those questions at the end that you didn't ask enough. Um, so I was, first I would say, yes, there were quite a few Latina farmers, but the Latina farmers were only the farmer when they were a single farmer. And so what I found was there were mostly couples that were in farming together. And when I'd asked to speak to the farmer, it was always, um, you know, the male farmer, the, the husband in most cases. So the limitation research-wise was that, especially once I finished my dissertation work in California, which was more ethnographic, where I got to know people really well over several years, much of the other research was really um, interview-based, where I would go, I'd meet a, a couple for one day, I'd hang out for a few hours, I'd tour their farm. Um, and in that case, it was really difficult to kind of ask questions about gender or challenge um, the ways that they presented themselves. And, you know, I would oftentimes purposely want to talk to the, the female partner, the wife, um, and she would only talk to me kind of like to fill in for her husband. But it was always clear that she was farming, right? Um, and so there was never a question to me if both both parts of the, the couple in this case were, were farmers, but whenever it was the farmer that got interviewed, it was always the male partner. Um, and so that's something like, as I said, if I could get to know each one of these couples, I would have tried to interrogate more, but in these situations, it wasn't really appropriate to, to push on that. Um, but of course, there were many situations where it was just um, a, a woman that was farming. Um, and, and that was a different type of conversation that we'd have. And I could kind of ask about, you know, gender and, and discrimination in that way, um, but that was the minority of farmers. So I can't really answer as to if there's a growing movement of Latina farmers. Um, you know, in, in a many cases, and this is the, the, the case for farm workers in the U.S., is that farm workers make very little money, right, on average ten to $15,000 across the course of an entire year. Women um, in the seasonal work, women lose their jobs first when the season ends. Um, so jobs that are kind of the female jobs, whether that's packing, um, trimming, that type of thing, um, the, the female crews get let go first, which means that women already just structurally have less savings and are more dependent upon their male farmers in farm worker communities, like in most communities, right? Um, so the idea that they would be able to go out on their own was even more of a challenge. Um, but yeah, there's a lot more to look there, look at with, I think, with Latina farmers. Um, thank you. I keep having more follow-up questions myself, but I'm trying to play the <laughs> moderator here. Um, uh, so here's the question. In your research, did you see any trends around forming agricultural cooperatives? 
Uh, is this a model that immigrant farmers are utilizing? Yes, yeah, so that's a really good question. And it's definitely one that I was looking at. Um, and I'd say overall, the answer was they were very resistant to cooperatives. Um, and so I, and I, I asked a lot of questions about that. Um, and, you know, a lot of them just talked about personal negative experiences with farming cooperatives. Um, whether that was kind of in the United States or back home, I even found that there was a lot of extended families where you'd have one nuclear family farming. This happened a lot in Virginia. Um, and then down the road, their cousin or their brother and sister would be farming and they wouldn't even wanna share a truck. And they had good relationships. They weren't like a family that was fighting, but they really were adverse to working together. Um, and I can't say I have a really good analysis for why, um, except that to say, I think in, in US agriculture in general, um, there's not, a ton of support for, there's support for marketing cooperatives. There's not a lot of support at the, um, in sales for um, farming cooperatives. It's just a harder structure. Um, and the fact is, I think a lot of people that wanna stay in agriculture and in farming, um, they just talk to me, well, I don't wanna work with anyone, right? I and mean, there was just kind of a personal note um, where, you know, farming's not a very social, um, livelihood. It, it's why I didn't want to stay in farming is I just want to work with people all the time. And I, I think a lot of people that stay in farming, they really want to work by themselves. And I don't think this is like an ethnic or racial issue. Um, working in farming is, is somewhat isolating. And I think a lot of people that want to stay in agriculture, they like that part of it. And when it gets complicated in the types of relationships that cooperatives really require, it's not the kind of work that they want to be doing. And that's what a lot of them said is I don't want to work with them down the road. I want my own business that's why I'm doing this. I want the independence, um, you know, and then as far as looking at it historically, um, you know, many of them came from Mexico. Many of them had negative experiences in their generation with the Ejido system there. So there might be some kind of historical reasons that they didn't want to be in cooperatives, um, but I don't have like a solid, a solid answer. Um, there were a few cooperatives that I interviewed, but most of those cooperatives were people that had come um, from more of an activist background. So they had done some farm worker organizing first and then started their own farms. They weren't following um, the same trajectory as most of the farmers that were going straight from farm work into farm ownership. Well, maybe I'll ask another person's question that's related to this, which is um, the extent to which the farms or the farm works were networked with each other. Um, you know, those who study agriculture and alternative forms of agriculture often see that where those who participate in those fields um, often know that there are, you know, networking with different farms is one strategy uh, of being sustainable um, in face of a, of a system that generally doesn't support the type of work that they're doing. So were these forms networked with, to each other is the question um, or with other alternative farms, whether this was through organizations or through other, um, other networks that they might be part of. Do you know? Yeah, and, and overall the answer was not as much as I, I thought I would see. Um, so in California and Washington, most farmers that I interviewed, not all, had been through a farmer training program, an incubator program. So in California, Alba Organics, and in Washington, Viva Farms. So they were networked, some of them through kind of going through a training together. Um, but typically once they started their own farm, they didn't really want to stay in touch through organizations. And that was actually one of the questions that I would ask, well, are you, you know, also because I, I, I'm networked with different organizations through this work and would you want to be followed up with through an organization? Um, and usually the answer was no. Um, and, you know, people just were happy farming. They didn't want to have to spend a lot of time on the type of organizational structural, or, um, or organizational work um, that I think um, networks involve. Um, and then locally, what they found was they were left out of, of alternative farming networks, right? They didn't feel included, say, in the community of farmers at the farmer's market. They didn't feel included when they went into agrarian spaces. People saw them as workers. And so certainly in the white alternative farming networks, they felt they had been pushed out. Um, and there weren't, in these areas, um, really strong networks of just um, you know, immigrant farmers. And I think what we're seeing in growing communities of farmers of color, um, new immigrants aren't always included in those communities, right? I mean, there's just a really basic language barrier 
um, they're not kind of hit people in their 20s. They're, they're immigrants that um, are not networked in with these these communities that I think are, are making some of the, the pushes in terms of social movements. I think immigrant farmers are still really left out of that from what I was seeing. Just they're located in really rural areas. Um, you know, they might, their only interaction um, with kind of food movements might just be at a farmer's market once a week and they don't always speak the language of most people at the market. So they're still pretty isolated. I mean, I, I think that that could change for sure. But I think it, it, it requires outreach from other social movements to immigrant farmers that are really isolated. That's interesting. Um, I want to ask maybe some questions about policy. And as we were, for all of you who are uh, in the session here, as we were thinking about today's event and uh, the fact that it's taking place just a few week and a half before the US national elections thinking about like, what does this work mean for policy? And so indeed there are some questions about this. Um, one person has asked, uh, I would love to learn more about policy changes you would, you think would lift up these farmers, especially in terms of access to land and eliminating bureaucracy that includes them from resources like the Natural Resources Conservation Service programs, et cetera. Yeah, I mean, I think there's really small things and there's really big things. Um, so during the course of this research, of course, I saw us go in the wrong direction in terms of inclusion. Um, so I was looking closely at all the different states I was in, if just forms were translated into Spanish. Like one of the big barriers is really just language. And that's seemingly the easiest one, right, that we can address is just making sure things are in multiple languages on a website, say. Um, and I found while it was really difficult, first of all, when I was doing my research, which was during the Obama era, during um, Vilsack was our, the head of our Department of Agriculture, and he actually made a public statement, the head of the USDA at the time, that this was the moment for civil rights at the USDA. There was a really active movement to make the USDA more inclusive from a racial justice standpoint, um, you know, during that period of time before this current administration. Um, and even then, not a lot happened. Um, so what we started to see was really incremental. Um, it was a lot more about hiring a more diverse staff at the USDA, which is wonderful. Of course, they, they are doing the opposite now. Um, but I still found that when, you know, I would go to the websites and see, okay, well, where are the forms in Spanish? Sometimes they had them, it was very much state by state. Um, sometimes they'd be really buried, like you'd have to click through three different links to get to the Spanish um, language translation. And then what I found when I went back, when I was writing the book, um, just to affirm what I had seen before, um, after the change administration, they had actually wiped all the Spanish language off the USDA website. So just like we wiped things off like climate change, they actually wiped the Spanish language translation stuff off the USDA website. You can still find it because it's been archived. I think they legally can't take things off the website permanently. Um, so you have archived translated forms, but nothing on the main website as far as I could see. Um, and then I actually spoke with people in USDA offices um, about well, well, what would it take to get um, people speaking Spanish even in the offices? Because in Washington state, I actually encountered a few Spanish speaking um, staff members that were doing incredible outreach to immigrants farmers and farm workers as part of the USDA, but that was their only, that was their personal, you know, thing that they were doing essentially. No one had hired them to do this. No one had hired them because they spoke Spanish. Um, and they said that they, to be required to, th this is what I was told, to be required to hire a certain percentage um, or to, to, re to be required to translate paperwork and to hire Spanish speaking staff they already had to have a certain percentage of participation in the program to show the need, which of course is not gonna happen, right? Until you actually translate and make it a hospitable environment. Um, so I think I just went on a tangent there, but saying there, so there's some small stuff, right? That is really doable with the right kind of people in, in administration that wanna see these changes made to make say um, a regional office more um, amenable, right? But then, of course, you have the huge structural barriers of just kind of immigration policy, um, of land access, um, you know, and so I, I like to point to in California, the Farmer Equity Act that was passed several years ago. I'm not sure how successful um, or, or what types of, you know, really on the ground um, 
effects that they've had, but at the very least, it's a, an act in California that is starting to address the inequality in agriculture. So specifically, based, this, this act was, was um, passed um, because of the discrimination at the USDA, the Pigford case, the Hispanic farmers case saying we need to look at discrimination within the USDA, at least at the state level, because we know nothing's happening federally right now. Um, so I think there are ways to structurally address it um, through, at least right now, through state level policy. Uh, well, and building on that, there's a question about city uh, support. Our cities, this is about funding, but we could also maybe broaden this to think about city or region, city policy, are cities or any cities that you know of providing specific funding or technical assistance support to new farmers starting their own enterprises? What could that look like ideally? The person asking says they work for city government. Oh, in terms of like urban agriculture specifically. Um, so I don't do a lot of research kind of in the city. Um, Kristen's actually maybe a better person to ask about this. Um, most of the farmers I was interviewing uh, were in rural areas. And so they were only going to the city for markets. Um, so as far as, you know, urban zoning and, and policy, I mean, there are definitely examples. You know, the one that I'm aware of is Baltimore creating really progressive kind of um, land access um, for, for people that want to farm. But I do think urban farming is incredibly different because you're looking at zoning issues. Whereas in the rural areas where I was looking, they were zoned agricultural already. Um, so they were farming on, on land that had already been farmed. So I think the, the urban question is, is different. But certainly if we address the urban and open um, you know, urban areas for immigrant farmers and other farmers of color as well, it's it's part of solving the problem, right? Any land access is, is helpful. Well, and I think um, if I may <laughs> say one thing, which is that I, I know that in New York State, there are programs that are both helping new immigrants learn how to navigate the bureaucracies of a farm business in the United States as, as do exist in, in other states as well. And Laura, and you talk about this in them in your book. Uh, and mentioned it in your presentation, but I think that there are, I know that there are also some efforts to connect that to um, you know, regional food systems and connecting people who are learning farming in an urban setting um, with rural agriculture so that they might farm in rural settings or that there might be a mutually supportive relationship created on a regional scale. That's my two cents. Yeah. Uh, let's see, a couple more questions maybe. Um, there was a question about kind of the overlap. Here's I'm going to ask this question and the overlap between new immigrant farm workers um, and the person that questioner <laughs> gives the example of Minnesota and farmer to farmer programs like ALBA. Um, so the overlap between these types of programs, who provides national technical assistance for these efforts, such as it, um, based on your research, is funding through programs, there's a lot of acronyms here, some of which I know and some I don't, um, okay. like photo beginning farmer and rancher development program, are they a successful way to advance alternative farming networks? So if you got that, I think it's kind of about the connections between different types of training programs in the areas that you studied and perhaps those, the connections between those programs and government supported programs like those of the USDA that help people to uh, learn how to um, operate farm businesses in the United States. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I think the simple answer is yes, there's a lot of overlap and, and the overlap's already happening. Um, and so, you know, one thing that's important to recognize is even if um, immigrant farmers are not getting um, direct support, say from like their local USDA or cooperative extension, anyone that's benefited from one of these incubators, like was mentioned, um, you know, ALBA or um, the new farmer entry program here on the East Coast, um, right? I mean, those institutions certainly get grants from the USDA, not like big money, right? But, but there are grants, there are small grants um, that are going to institutions, to building farmers markets, to nonprofits. Of course, that's all based on the farm bill and it's not secure funding and there's lots of problems there. 
Um, but certainly those institutions and those organizations are really helpful. And I think the most helpful thing that an institution like ALBA, and I actually, as part of my dissertation, I sat in on the ALBA class for six months. So I, as part of like an ethnography, I, I took the, the farmer training um, along with the immigrant farmers that I was, that I was interviewing. And, um, you know, they really were giving them these, the types of business skills that are super important, right? How do you do your taxes? How do you figure out how to establish um, the type of paperwork, the type of stuff that they really needed? Um, so absolutely, those institutions play a really important role. Um, what's amazing to me is that there were immigrant farmers succeeding all over the country without that kind of support. Um, so in the places where they had it, it was really, really helpful. And I think um, that's where I saw farmers over a specifically the newest farmers uh, or the newest immigrants, people that um, had come most recently to the US or that most recently had been farm workers um, were really benefiting from those types of programs um, in terms of just getting those really practical skills. So yeah, I think those institutions are really important places to support you know, immigrant farmers and alternative farmers. And so I'm not sure if I answered the question, but I think um, the answer would be yes. I think there's a lot of overlap and they're really important institutions. We need to fund them better too, <laughs> so they can do more. Mm -hmm. and, and all of these circle together because funding also is a policy question. Yeah, exactly. Um, well, thanks. Another question that we have is the following. Uh, I wonder if you've explored a reparations-based approach to offering land to BIPOC farmers. I wonder if you've explored and or found examples of a reparations-based, oh, sorry, that was, they wrote the question twice. So that's the question. <laughs> um, not in the context of, of this book specifically. I mean, I've been following it more just personally, right? The types of examples, um, you know, more specifically land going to um, African-American uh, farmers um, or the idea, right, that there should be reparations. Um, I mean, I think it intersects and certainly in the book, I talk a lot about the history of African-American farmers being dispossessed from their land or dispossessed multiple times over, right? Um, but actually there's a history of African-American freed slaves starting farms in the U.S., getting access to land and having a very short period there of successfully farming in the U.S. And then ironically, there's a book by Pete Davidson, uh, no, Pete Daniel called Dispossession about the time period during, during the civil rights period um, where African-American farmers were dispossessed by USDA policies um, and the push towards industrial farming, the push towards a more kind of scientific recorded model of farming pushed, was part of pushing out African-American farmers that had succeeded. Um, you know, post slavery to start their own farms and the commonalities between those um, experiences and those groups of farmers. Um, and so while I'm not seeing as, you know, the question about networking, I'm not seeing a lot of networking with immigrant farmers and say, you know, other BIPOC or African-American farmers looking at things like reparations, the common history is, is certainly there of kind of multiple forms of dispossession. And the immigrant farmers that I'm talking to, right, have been dispossessed, um, you know, in their home countries through economic policy, um, right, through colonization, and then coming to the U.S. and then this experience of being workers and, and kind of then trying to reclaim land, just multiple levels um, of, of dispossession. And I think then coming to saying, well, we still want to farm, we still want land, and and how do we think about that in a big picture? So I think there's there's a common struggle. Um, I don't see, I haven't seen, and maybe other people here, right, know more about where that common fight is, is coming together. Um, well, thank you. I, I would like to ask a question, if I could, that kind of builds on that previous one. Um, and so in the class, and my students in my class and I have focused on one of the chapters in your book uh, that describes the Ijido program and uh, land dis dispossession in Mexico during the early part of the 20th century. So um, my question though is with that background, um, have you, uh, even if you're not continuing to do this research, you know, after having published the specific research after having published the book, have you um, heard about or are you aware of um, any 
uh, continued influence that the shifts from NAFTA to the U.S.-Mexico-Canada agreement has, uh, has begun to have on farmers' ability to remain in Mexico and, and farm. So you mean in terms of farmers that are still in Mexico? Yes. Um, and like what is happening currently with farmers in Mexico? Uh, in terms of the push of in, of migration out of Mexico, that's 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 in some ways influenced by these trade policies. Right. Um, I'm not sure if I really have a, an answer. Um, you know, another thing I wish I had been able to do was actually go to Mexico and interview. Um, and many of them, you know, actually still own land and farms in Mexico, even if they hadn't been able to go back and visit or be part of it, or some of them that had been here longer and had documentation status would go back and forth and have a farm in Mexico and a farm in the United States. Um, so I always wished I could have done that trip as part of the book, but then of course I'd still be writing the book or multiple trips, right, to ask these kinds of questions. Um, so I guess I don't, I can't say I really am knowledgeable about what's going on with agriculture in Mexico you know, today, besides kind of some of the, the wonderful other books that are out there. Um, you know, I just, I just read and taught the book Eating NAFTA um, that I thought was really helpful in terms of understanding these multiple sides of the border and what's going on. But, you know, I don't think my own research, my, my own research experience, I can't really answer that question. Fair enough. <laughs> Thank you for entertaining it. <laughs> uh, I think I'll ask a couple more questions and then and then we'll see where we're at. Uh, so there are a couple of re related questions. I want to make sure I get them in the right order here. So one is I'm just going to ask them together. How hard is it to farm and have your sales based in uh, the farmer's market system and direct sales is one question. And related to that, I think, is have you seen any policies to make vendor access to farmers markets more equitable? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, those are really good questions. And I spent a lot of time at farmers markets as part of this research. Oftentimes I would meet farmers at markets where I had been kind of tipped off. Well, there's a lot of immigrant you know, farmers at this market. You should just go walk around there, which I would do. Um, and, um, you know, so the question of is it, is it difficult to sell in those markets? Um, so that really depended on the region. And so as I was saying before, California is just incredibly saturated in terms of farmers markets, alternative farms, um, access to kind of the, the high end markets. So that is, that is really challenging. And because it's so competitive, um, you know, in terms of the perfect marketing, the perfect banner, the perfect social media to become that one of those well-known farmers and actually make a living is very difficult. And that's one of the regions where I really saw people being pushed out of the direct market because um, they just couldn't get access to those high-end consumers. The same thing with the restaurants. Um, you know, there's, there's people whose entire career it is to go foraging into the farmer's markets and make connections for restaurants. And if you're not networked in that way, if you're not, you know, speaking English, if you don't know kind of the culinary world in the United States, it's really hard to get an in. So California is almost like a really extreme example of how difficult that is. Washington state was more middle ground where, um, you know, there was still room to get into some of the markets. Um, there's a lot of small towns where people will pay good money, you know, in the farmer's markets. And of course, all of this doesn't even address the inequality in food access, right? Um, you know, but then places like Virginia and Washington DC, we're just not as much the foodie culture and that's where I'm from. Um, the foodie culture is really just different there. You can get into farmers markets. It's not, there aren't as many people farming around the Washington DC area, right? So I didn't see that as big of a barrier. You didn't need the perfect marketing and the perfect, um, you know, image at the farmers market to have someone come to your stand. It was, it was oddly more accessible, right? Um, and similar in other regions. Um, and so, uh, and New York just has so many farmers markets and I can talk more about New York. I actually didn't talk about New York very much in this talk at all. Um, and so as far as making it more accessible for vendors, I actually saw in Washington state, I saw some of the most incredible things happening where one of the market managers was actually one of my primary contacts because she was doing, she had gotten a small grant, the Washington Small Farms Program out there associated with Washington State University and was doing some really proactive work to help immigrant farmers in terms of training them in signage, figuring out how to get things translated for them. Again, really small things, but things that made a difference. 
um, making sure that all the rules of the market were in both languages, making sure they always had, if they were, a lot of markets do farm visits to affirm that things are actually coming from a region locally, making sure there was always someone available to do that, um, that they could speak Spanish and communicate with the family. Um, so there were ways, but you know, honestly, I saw this as a much more individual process than anything happening in a structural or streamlined way. But at the same time, farmers markets are um, are not top down. There, there's not a top down organization of farmers markets. Farmers markets in the United States are mostly run by nonprofits throughout the U.S. So it really varies, right, in terms of even what types of things that a farmers market expects. Um, and so in that way, there was a lot of variance in terms of how welcoming a farmers market was um, and who the the market manager was and if they were suspicious of the immigrants, which I also heard. Um, you know, we don't, we don't really think that they are bringing their own stuff that they would confide in me, right? Because I was a white woman at the market and they would say things to me like that. Um, so it really varied. Um, and I think just like what I saw in the USDA offices, um, it, it varied in terms of the individuals that were involved. Um, thing, there was not like a streamlined system to make these places more equitable. So great things that, that wonderful individuals were doing, but that doesn't solve these problems in a grander scale. Uh, I think that there's a couple more questions that are related to each other and then a few comments that I'll highlight. Uh, uh, so the, the, maybe the last couple questions, how can the current trend toward regenerative farming help immigrant farmers? And the second question is beyond creating materials in Spanish and other languages, what are some ways that the cooperative extension system can better support immigrant farming communities? Yeah, those are such good questions. Um, so the, I'll just answer the cooperative extension one. What I found talking to a cooperative extensions is a lot of time, and this is a limitation, um, of course, of any you know, office doing work with rural um, constituents is oftentimes they would say, well, you know, these are the, the email addresses I have, um, or this is the, um, the list of people we've always worked with. And with immigrant farmers, they're, what I found is they're just so off the radar of what those lists are of the people they've always reached out to, the, the people they've always talked to. And so what I found with both USDA and Cooperative Extension is they didn't know like how to reach, um, you know, new farmers that weren't already well networked themselves. And I don't think that's like a fault of any individuals in those offices. Oftentimes they really wanted to reach out and didn't know how. Um, so of course, I mean, in order to do that, it has to be, there has to be someone that, that can speak the language. Um, but I think it's also just actively pursuing the farmers to put them on the radar, to get their address. I mean, and this was hard for me as a researcher, so I'm not saying it's an easy thing. Oftentimes, right, um, farmers that are more marginalized economically, they're not living on their farm they don't even necessarily have an address where their farm is because, um, you know, I would have to drive through someone else's land first and then get to this random plot that they had access to. Um, and so they were really just literally off the radar of not even having addresses. Um, and this was a problem, I didn't even get into the agricultural census and how they're not being counted. Um, but I guess just changing any assumptions that that we've reached farmers um, and, and looking you know, through markets and, and doing outreach, I guess, in more, more, more aggressive ways to find farmers that are not on the radar um, is, is maybe the first thing um, that, that needs to be happening more um, is just assuming that they're not on the listservs and they're not, they're not networked in other ways. So finding them um, is, a, is another barrier, um, right, from an outreach perspective. But um, you know, once, at least for me, once I kind of met a few people then, and, and people thought I was a safe person to talk to, then it was, well, here, talk to this other person, this other person, but it was usually like a cell phone. Um, there was no easy way to find them. And so um, I guess that's the, the challenge is, is finding them and in, in outreaching in ways that, um, that they need to be outreached to. So I don't think it's an easy thing though. And I forget, what was the other... Um, how can the trend toward regenerative farming help immigrant farmers? Um, I mean, I don't off the top of my head have a specific definition of regenerative versus kind of alternative more broadly. 
Um, but I guess my assumptions around regenerative would be, well, these farmers are already practicing what we, what I think of as sustainable or alternative or agroecology. So I wrote an article about how they're contributing to agroecological practices with Rick Welsh. Um, and I think, um, I guess the question is how, how do we as people interested in alternative food support the farmers that are already doing it um, is the way that I look at it. It's so hard to answer questions without like making eye contact with the person asking me if I answered the question at all. It's not the most ideal. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I think, um, I think that one could just comment on your previous response um, about um, reaching out or outreach or connection between government programs and farmers. I think I was listening to you and thinking about some of your other work on farm worker led advocacy. And it seems to me that this also underscores the, um, the importance of um, those types of networks in helping people navigate systems and understand information that are outside of um, the government programs, particularly given some of the, um, the discrimination that has taken place that you talk about in your, in your book and that you've talked about today. Well, I think I've managed to ask all of the questions that were even some of them were uh, similar to each other. So I coupled those together. Uh, just a couple of comments that everyone I think can see in the chat that the Journal of Agriculture, Food Systems and Community Development, which is open access, says um, has 78 results if you search for the word Latino and just published a review of Laura Ann's book. So people can check that out. And if you can find it in the chat, there's a link. Um, and another link to a Forbes article um, about the Washington DC region and farmers markets. So I encourage mm -hmm. folks to check those out if they would like to. Uh, and I think that we've gotten to all the questions. So I don't know, Laura, Ann, if you want to say anything in conclusion or any points additional that you would like to add. No, thank you so much. And um, thanks for all these really good questions. I'm hoping I can like copy the chat so I can actually look at the comments later. But um, We have them for you. <laughs> oh, okay, awesome. Yeah, because it was hard to look at them while I was talking. But and thank you so much for the invitation. And, and also, Kristen, thank you for um, looking at all the questions because I couldn't have done that while talking. <laughs> and yeah, if I have a final a final word, it's just everyone go vote. That, that's like all I'm gonna say over the next week. Um, in New York, we have early voting. It started last weekend. So if you haven't already, go vote please and, and in every other state where you are. Wonderful. And thank you so much for sharing about your research and answering all of these great questions. Uh, so thank you, Laura Ann. And thank you to everyone that has participated and, and stuck with us to the end. And I reiterate the, the get out the vote call. Have a great evening or afternoon, depending on where you're located. <laughs>